In this section, we're going to talk about probability. And all probability is, it's a way of quantifying how likely it is for an event to occur. We say if, if an event never occurs, if something never happens, we give it a probability of zero. That's something like rolling a seven on a six-sided die. There are no sevens, so it will never happen. And a probability of one is something always occurring. So something like the sun rising tomorrow. There's an example of an event that pretty much will always occur. So that we assign a probability of one. And anything in between, we give it a number. If it's closer to zero, it's less likely. And if it's closer to one, it's more likely. So flipping heads on a coin, if you just flip once and then record if you get heads or tails, well, the probability of that, it's about half the time heads, half the time tails. So you'd expect a probability of a half for flipping heads on a coin. Rolling a four on a six-sided die, well, there are six um, sides on a die, only one of them is four. So you'd expect a probability around one-sixth for that. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to determine the probability of events, but this just gives you a nice overview of what probability is in a qualitative sense. A little bit of jargon before we get going and talking more about probability. We really care about performing experiments, and they're just procedures where something happens and that something is unknown. You don't know exactly what will happen. There are some options. So we call that an experiment. We'll give you some examples. Well, if we flip a coin and we observe the face, well, we're uncertain what the face of the coin is going to be. It can be either be a head or a tail. So that's an uncertain result. Or we can roll a die and observe the number. It can be a one, two, three, four, five, or six on this die. So it's uncertain what happens. And it doesn't have to be one of these physical things where there are a finite number of um, results. Maybe playing a hockey game and recording the score. That's an experiment. Scores can be things like 3-1 or 2-2 or even 7-4. Or you could imagine something like mm -hmm. 65 to 12. It could be. It's very unlikely that a hockey game would have that score, but it could. So that's an experiment, and we call outcomes the results of those experiments, the most basic results. So outcomes for flipping a coin are heads and tails. Some outcomes for rolling a die, well, you can get a 1, you can get a 4, you can get a 3, you can get a 2, a 5, or a 6 as well. And... Hockey game scores, well, maybe the uh, away team won 3-1, or maybe the home team won 2-0. Usually, it's away on the left, home on the right. Or maybe the team's tied with four goals apiece, or whatever. They're examples of outcomes, just the most basic results of an experiment. A few more uh, definitions here. When we're talking about outcomes, sometimes we want to talk about a set of outcomes, not just one particular outcome, or in the book they also call them sample points. Uh, maybe we want to talk about a bunch of them together. And so we call those an event. And let me give you a couple of examples. So when you're flipping a coin, well, maybe the event can be just getting a head. So that's possible that an event has just one outcome in it. Or maybe if you're rolling a die, um, maybe we want the event being getting the numbers 1 and 4. Or we could even explain this in words. Is rolling the set of all rolling a square number. 1 and 4 is the square numbers on a die, since 1 times 1 is 1, 2 times 2 is 4, and they're the only numbers that are squares. Or this is the set of all possible odd numbers you can roll. 1, 3, and 5. So that's an example of another event, which we called E2, just to give it a different name. And sometimes if there's an infinite number of 
outcomes in an event, you can't list them all. So you have to just describe what they are. So maybe um, this event here can be all um, outcomes where the home team wins. So this is infinitely many outcomes. So describe. And you can always describe. Even if there's finitely many outcomes, it's fine to describe as well. So there are events. And the next piece of jargon is called the sample space. And that's just the term we use to refer to all possible outcomes together, the set of all possible outcomes. So in our first experiment, we flipped a coin. You can either flip a head or a tail, and that's it. So they are the outcomes of our experiment. So this set here is indeed the sample space of that experiment. For rolling a die, the outcomes you can get are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So the sample space is the set of all of those. And for playing a hockey game, S in this case, and yet we're going to score, is all possible scores, since our experiment is playing a hockey game and recording the score. So, a good way of visualizing events and experiments with sample spaces is to draw a little Venn diagram here. So, using the same event names that we did on the previous slide, where E1 was rolling a square number, so 1 and 4, and E2 was rolling an odd number, so 1, 3, or 5. Then we can draw this little diagram to help us out here. So I'm going to draw it kind of in two ways. Both are the same. So in this way, I listed all elements of our sample space, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And then I said, well, which elements are in E1? Well, 1 and 4. So I put a ring around those, or a circle around those. So they're included in E1. E2 was all odd numbers, so I put a, not quite a circle, but I had to bend it a little bit, but I put a fence around that, 1, 3, and 5. And then you can see here that 1 and 4 are in E1, 1, 3, and 5 are in E2, and it looks like there's an overlap between E1 and E2, which is the number 1, of course, and 2 and 6 are outside of either event. You could also do it like this. So this is the exact same information in this diagram, just arranged a little differently. So here's the circle representing E1, the circle representing E2. I know 1 and 4 are in E1, 1, 3, and 5 are in E2. 1 was in both, so it's in the intersection of E1 and E2. And 2 and 6 are outside both events here, but they're still in our sample space S. So that's a good idea for visualizing events. Well, now that we have the idea of what probability is, and a little bit of jargon, a good question is, how do we calculate probability? How would we determine the probabilities of events occurring? And we'll talk about situations where we know something about the likelihood of outcomes. But let's say we don't. This, can, this is a good way of figuring out probabilities of events in any situation you like. And the short answer is just do lots of experiments and record how many successes you get and how many experiments you ran. And then we say the probability is going to be that proportion, the number of successes over the number of experiments. So let's just do a quick example here. Let's pretend I have a coin and I have no idea what the probability of getting a head or getting a tail is. So, and I'm interested in the probability of getting a head. That's what I'm interested in. So, let's say I flip a coin five times. In fact, I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to do that right now. So, I did it and I got four heads and one tail. Therefore, our estimate of the probability of this event occurring. And remember, this is just an estimate, is, well, we had four successes, four times that fit into the event getting ahead, over five total experiments. One, two, three, four, five. 
So our estimate here is around four fifths, so that's 80%. And I think everybody intuitively knows that's pretty far off from the actual probability of flipping ahead. And that's because we only did very few experiments. There's this result called the law of large numbers, which is below. This thing here is called the law of large numbers. And it says that as the number of experiments goes to infinity, as you do more and more experiments, this proportion of the number of successes over the number of experiments, this approaches the actual true probability of this event E occurring. So if we want to get a more accurate estimate of our probability, we just have to run the experiment loads more times. So let's say instead I flipped the coin not five times, let's say I flipped it 500 times. So this is n equals 5, and we'll do n equals 500. I am going to stop the video now, and I'm going to do that experiment. So I did so, and I got 261 heads and 239 tails. So successes in this case, we count as heads. So, because that's the probability we're interested in, we got 261 successes. I ran the experiment 500 times. 261 of them, I got heads. The rest of them, 239, I got tails. So that's 500. So this time, my estimate for the probability of flipping a head is around 52.2%. Uh, now, if we know a little bit about probability, we know the actual probability is 50%, but you can see that we've got closer, and this pretty much happens all of the time. The more experiments you run, the more accurate your estimate for the probability of that event occurring is. So the moral of this story is just do lots of experiments. since. The law of large numbers tells you that the more you do, the better your approximation is, which means basically, more colloquially, your luck, whether it be good or bad, will eventually run out. That's what the law of large numbers says. Whether you're if you have good luck or bad luck, if you do an experiment enough, the probability will just approach what it's supposed to as you do more and more experiments.